very much, Barbara. And uh, I, it's, it's very, very good to be here. And uh, kind of uh, emotional, actually, and a little overwhelming, uh, because so much of my life has interconnected with many of you here. I'm, uh, I need to start off by saying that I am Tim Harrison, and I am um, a visiting professor at American University of Beirut, and, but on more normal occasions, professor of Near Eastern Archaeology at the University of Toronto. Now, if I can just say a little bit about uh, ACOR, um, actually my first connection was in 1985 as an exchange student, an undergraduate, and I uh, came to Jordan, and um, it was facilitated uh, by a USIA grant that ACOR was asked to administrate, but we basically spent uh, two months of our summer uh, where we were to come and work on various projects, and for me, um, I was sent to, uh, with a group to Yarmouk University, and the Institute of Archaeology, Anthropology and Archaeology had just been opened about that time, and I spent my summer working with two very dear colleagues in front who were um, directing excavations at that time, Jabal Abu Tawab and Zidane Kafafi, and then Wally Ibrahim, who was co-directing the excavations at Zerakun. And that summer changed my life, and um, I really, I was, I mean, I was already kind of crazy about archaeology, but uh, that summer really, really had an impact on me, such that I had been deeply committed and, and engaged with the archaeology and the culture and history the people of Jordan ever since. I also want to say uh, with Azibisha, we, uh, in 1992 I was living here as a fellow at ACOR uh, for a year with my family. I uh, had a little boy at that point, um, Andrew, who's now bigger than I am actually, <laughs> and I uh, was got involved helping out with a survey in Madaba, and, um, and it was shortly thereafter that uh, Azibisha was also became involved with the excavations. Um, in the area around the Burnt Palace, but Adiba Bushmais, who I haven't seen for many years, and he's in the room somewhere, yeah, was a part of that survey in 1992-93. So um, I, there are many connections, and these are just a few quick examples of the stories and the experiences I've had over more than 30 years um, working and uh, spending my time in Jordan. So it's very, very good to be back. And uh, this evening, I've been asked to give a talk about one of the projects that I'm working on. Um, Often life takes you in directions that you don't expect, and Barbara mentioned the whole business with ASOR. Um, these were things that I had never anticipated becoming involved in, and one of those uh, was to become involved with an archaeology project in southeastern Turkey. The connection or the reason for me is it was a personal one. Uh, when I was a student at the University of Chicago, my teacher, a person by the name of Douglas Essie, who had been planning to return to uh, this uh, excavations to this region, which had been conducted as a part of what was known as a Syrian Hittite expedition by the University of Chicago back in the 1920s and 30s. And he was applying every year for a permit, and he contracted cancer very young. He was in his early 40s and passed away before we were able to actually um, um, participate. I was a graduate student at that point. And so after I finished my PhD, I was asked if I might come to try and carry on this project. And this is how I got myself involved in the excavations at the site of Tainat, which you can see in this um, aerial photograph. And I was actually, at the time, directing excavations in uh, Tel Madaba as well. So I was trying really hard to maintain both excavations actively. Uh, fortunately, some of our staff and students, uh, one of my former students, Deborah Foran, many of you know, was able to maintain the, the mod of excavation so that I could help um, focus on this one and get it operational. But that's a bit of a personal connection, just to give you a sense of how sometimes our life stories and even experiences um, take us in unexpected and unanticipated ways. And for me, I still see these as part of the, the, the whole Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the Levant, and I'm very much interested in looking at northern and southern interconnections. And so a lot of the actual research questions that we're interested in um, really connect very nicely between the field work and the projects that I was involved in in, the, in, in Jordan, um, uh, particularly in Madaba and the central parts of, uh, of Jordan, and now um, with this active project in the north, um, trying to compare and contrast. And I can give you one quick example of that as we proceed. But just to summarize in a very brief way the, what I want to cover this evening, as the title of my talk um, hints, I'm going to focus on essentially two cultural strata dealing with the early Iron Age. The Sea Peoples will deal with roughly the period of around 1200, early to 1100 BC. And then the second period will be associated with what we call the Neo-Hittites, 
and this will be a, a period, cultural period that coincides, we call it the early Iron II, um, essentially the period of about the 10th and 9th centuries into the early um, part of the 8th century. Because of a few of you that I knew would be here, I'm going to cheat a little bit and, die, and bring in a little bit more um, from our excavations on the early Bronze Age. We have also begun to excavate, I'll touch on that briefly. And then I've also thought I should bring in a little bit on the Neo-Assyrians, which is the very end, the terminal phase of occupation at Taina. So um, these are full-blown uh, lectures on their own, so I'll only be able to give a kind of a tease uh, so that we can focus on these other two primary uh, cultural horizons. So let me just set briefly the backdrop for the uh, early Iron Age, the Sea Peoples. Many of you, maybe all of you, are well aware of them as a, as a kind of phenomenon. And they coincide with a, one of the epic transformations or transitional periods in human history, the transition from the end of the Bronze Age into the early Iron Age. Historically, we put that at 1200 BCE. And um, one of the most famous accounts it's really, in part, a vivid uh, scene that you can see here that was carved on the north wall of the mortuary temple of Ramses III in West Thebes called Medinet Habu. And I'm not going to have time to go into the details of it, but you can see there's a battle, kind of a big naval battle here. Down here, the other key thing is you see a bunch of um, people being led away. If you look carefully, you can see that they're bound, many of them. And these are the so-called Sea Peoples, who in this scene are essentially invading, attacking the delta, the shores of Egypt. And you have um, the pharaoh and his, um, his uh, troops trying to repel them. And then the aftermath is essentially what's being depicted here. Having defeated them, um, they've captured some of them. What's important for us here is that we have the names of at least five of these so-called Sea Peoples groups. And one of them it has been identified as the Palisset. And this is a term I just want to place out there now. I will come back to that shortly. And this is a very old, but somewhat, I think, still relevant map that tries to sketch in a kind of global way what people think, or scholars think, or thought was the basic migratory pattern associated with these sea peoples. That essentially they came from somewhere in the Aegean world, or even maybe farther to the west, or maybe from multiple different places. There are, of course, theories of them coming from Anatolia, particularly from western Anatolia. In the context of Troy, there's the connections that have been made with the early stories of the, um, the Homer, uh, Homer's uh, the Iliad and Odyssey, that those may somehow connect. I don't have time to weave all these together, but many of these are gaining increasing historical uh, credibility, in particular epi um, epigraphic discoveries that have been made in this region of southern Anatolia in recent years. You'll have to read up about that or ask me about that later. I just do not have time to uh, dust that today. And then here's where they went to the, all the way down into Egypt and tried to um, attack Egypt in that scene that I showed from the previous slide. I'd like to kind of give an overview that has a before and after to try and frame the larger historical questions for this early Iron Age context. So the Medinet Habu relief provides a kind of before or at the moment of these sea peoples as preserved in their account. Certainly it's a complex document with its own historical issues or historiography. A second one that I like is, a, is more of a, a narrative, a, a, like an adventure tale, or travel log, you might say, the travels of Wenamun, who was an Egyptian official who passed through the Levant. It's something you should read if you haven't. He describes his adventures going up the Levantine coast. He was sent to go and find and get cedars from Lebanon to help in the building project of one of the larger temple or, or public building complexes in Egypt of that time. And he um, was from the early 11th century. And what's relevant for us here is that he stops in at a number of places along the coast as he travels north looking for cedars. And everywhere he goes, he describes encountering some of these sea people groups who had been named on the Medinet Habu relief. So essentially, by the early 11th century, we can say with some confidence, and this is just one example, that whomever these sea peoples were, they had begun to establish themselves. They had settled, they had integrated or assimilated themselves into communities along the Levantine coast. So this is how I want to frame our basic uh, question in, in terms of what is happening in this transitional period from the collapse of the great Bronze Age civilizations of the second millennium and the emergence of new 
cultures, new societies, new polities, new governments in the early part of the Iron Age. Now, a lot of work has been done in the southern Levant, dealing with the, uh, the Sea Peoples. They've been associated with the Philistines of the Bible. And this is a, an area where there's been an enormous amount of archaeological work, I'd say, over the last 30 plus years, a very sustained attention trying to understand the material culture of this early period and how that may relate to these elusive historical questions. What I want to do is focus on the north, an area that has not been well documented up until very, very recently. And to try and do so, I want to go back to the principal imperial power that controlled this region in the, at the end of the late Bronze Age, and that were the Hittites. And we know that they, under uh, particularly a Hittite ruler by the name of Shupiluliuma, who um, in the early part, or late, late 14th, early 13th century, is um, credited with conquering much of western Syria, and integrating it into this larger um, Hittite imperial uh, network or system. And uh, that system, more or less, we think, historically, was in place down until around 1200, and the, also the, the larger collapse of Bronze Age societies that included the collapse of the Hittite Empire. So this is the, the historical backdrop, is I want you to remember this green line, and essentially this area, and we're going to focus in this area here, which has in the late Bronze Age, the city of Alalak is the principal uh, Bronze Age uh, city, and also the, the royal city of a small kingdom known as the Kingdom of Mukish. Now, we often think about this period, and historians have referred to it as a Dark Age, because of the historical break, the collapse of these Bronze Age empires, it's understood or presumed to have ushered in a period of political collapse and chaos and fragmentation. It's called a dark age because presumably we don't have written sources that can help give us a sense of the political history. Well, this is an entirely inaccurate statement or characterization for what's happening in our northern Levantine context. And as just one example, the work of a British historian by the name of David Hawkins, a very a brilliant philologist and historian, working with a script that I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail shortly called Hieroglyphic Luvian. I dare say many of you may not have even heard of this. It's a very, um, a, a very uh, a limited, known, uh, inscri uh, inscribed or, or pictographic uh, script. It has nothing to do with Egyptian hieroglyphics or anything like that. In any case, working with epigraphic material in Hieroglyphic Luvian, Already in the 80s, he was able to piece together a, a line of rulers who started out first as viceroys, particularly this guy here by the name of Shark, Shari Kushu, who was the son of our Shupiluliuma, the king I mentioned. When Shupiluliuma, Shupiluliuma took the area, he installed his son as a viceroy to maintain uh, the lowlands while he focused his efforts and attention up in the highlands. And what we have through a series of epigraphic finds that have been made, um, some of these are seal impressions and rather mundane uh, types of epigraphic material, David Hawkins was able to piece together a succession of father to son rulers who were initially viceroys down until the reign of the last king of the Hittite Empire, a guy by the name of you know, predictably enough, I guess, Shupiluliuma, but this time number two, when he died, the next ruler at Carchemish, a guy named Kuziteshu, he started adopting the royal titles of the kings of the Hittites, something that had been reserved only for the rulers based in Katushap in the highlands. So this tells us that something has happened with the collapse of the Hittite Empire. There continued to be dynastic succession and the emergence of some kind of a polity, some kind of a kingdom at Carchemish into the early Iron Age period. And what he was able to piece together was a line of rulers, we don't really know much about them, but it suggests that there's some kind of political continuity throughout this period, at least at the site of Carchemish, which became known as Khati, or the Kingdom of Khati. So I just give that as one example. And the second example that I want to take a closer look at, which brings us to our excavations at Tainat, took on a new turn in about 2004, 2005, when ongoing excavations on the Aleppo Citadel in this area right here, 
began uncovering, a German-Syrian expedition, began uncovering a massive temple dedicated to the storm god. And it's now known that this was the storm god temple, and uh, the one that was sort of the, the dominant one for the entire uh, West Syrian context. And their excavations have been able to uncover levels of this temple going all the way back to the third millennium, uh, the early Bronze Age. But what's relevant for us was a discovery when they expanded the trenches of their uh, excavations. This was a very sensitive ex or delicate excavation because you have the medieval remains up here, including a mosque, and so they had to negotiate very carefully within a con confined space. But off to the, you, you can almost see here on the left, a series of carved reliefs. These are from the Bronze Age phase of the temple. But off on a side wall over here, there was inserted in the early Iron Age, we are dating this to basically about 1100 BC, is a very interesting uh, scene where you have a, a representation of Teshub, the storm god right here. And we know that because, among other things, his headdress and his dress uh, signal that he is in fact or what is the storm god. But we also have two hieroglyphic signs of these, this Luvian uh, hieroglyphic script that tell us that this is who we're looking at. So he's named. And then facing him is actually a human figure. And it may be a little hard for you to see, but it's kind of etched in graffiti. It's almost like a cartoon quote coming out of his mouth. And it scrolls up over his head. And then down the back here on these registers behind him is a complete inscription. It's a dedicatory inscription. What's of relevance to us here is in the opening, he tells us who he is. He says, I am Teta, the hero, ruler of the land of Palestine. And then he says, he goes on to say that I'm the lord of the of Halab, of Aleppo, and of the storm god who he is honoring. And then he had, the rest of the inscription is a pretty standard fare uh, religious uh, dedicatory inscription. But what's relevant and what got everybody's attention, in addition to the fact is who is Teta, he's calling himself these royal titles that had been reserved only for the Hittite kings. So he's claiming a level of, of political dominance that was unique or un, uh, unusual. And then he says that he's the ruler of this place called Palestine. And this is something that since it was first reported in about 2005, has drawn an enormous amount of discussion and debate. Now, just to touch back with the uh, Medina and Habu reliefs, I mentioned the Peleset. Here are some scenes that have been at least assumed to be possible representations or, or uh, images, if you, if you will, of what the Peleset might have looked like. But David Hawkins, who was the person working on these inscriptions, proposed at a conference in 2005 that the Palestine term was etymologically probably the same as the Palaset mentioned on the Medina Habu release. So what happened subsequently is that we began to go back and look through some of these hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions and we realized that actually in the 1930s when the University of Chicago was excavating at our site of Tainat, they had found at least one hieroglyphic Luvian inscription that mentions this place. Also, uh, two had been found, two uh, monuments had been found in little villages of Shehzar and Meharde near Hama, northwest of Hama. So in addition to actually a second inscription that was found at Aleppo, we now have uh, from our own excavations a second one from Taina. We have the two from the south. And then a few years ago, uh, some salvage excavations at a, at a port site called Arsu in southeastern Turkey found two more. So we now have, just in the past five years or so, we have more than half a dozen. We have a growing number of these hieroglyphic inscriptions that keep mentioning this place. And that has allowed us to hypothesize that perhaps we're looking at a geographical region that encompasses more or less the, the area that I've marked here as a critical place where this land of Palestine might be, have been historically associated. I'll come back to that point, but let's take a quick and a survey of the archaeological record from Tainat, and then we'll come back to that historical question. So just brief background for those of you who have not heard of Tainat before. It's located right at the northern bend of the, Euphrates, uh, the Orontes River, um, heading out to the delta and to the Mediterranean. 
It's a real strategic location because it's essentially at um, one of the great intersections or crossroads of the ancient Near East. It's the, one of, uh, at the gateway to one of the main entrances up into the Anatolian highlands. It's historically been one of the main approaches from the Syro-Mesopotamian interior up to the Mediterranean coast. And then it has deep ties, as I mentioned earlier, north-south along the Levantine uh, coast. And then it also has historically had very active ties with the Aegean world. So it's really right at a critical intersection. And for us archaeologists, that makes it very interesting because it becomes something of a bellwether. It gives us an indicator of it's sensitive to cultural change, to historical developments. And so for us, this becomes an important motivation to try and uh, study the archaeological record uh, from this uh, place. Now, do, you may be able to place this um, site a little bit more if I tell you that it's also a couple hundred meters away from the site of Tel Achana, which is ancient Alalak, the site I mentioned, that's often uh, better known because of the excavations by Leonard Woolley back in the 1930s and 40s, but it's only about 20, 30 kilometers away as well from the site of Antioch, the great city which we're told was second only to Rome at its peak during the classical Era. So in many ways what we're looking at here is that Tainat and Achana together seem to have formed a kind of complementary cultural history. The two sites were, were occupied in alternating uh, succession and then after Tainat was destroyed at the end of the, its last uh, settlement at the end of the Iron Age, Iron Age then eventually uh, during the Hellenistic period you have the establishment of Antioch. So in a sense these three sites together provide a cultural profile that goes from sometime in the mid to late 4th millennium BC all the way down into the Common Era. And the reason simply is because of its location. It's critically, uh, these two sites are critically at the optimal east-west, north-south intersection of these uh, regions that I just articulated. They also have a very interesting and complex uh, geomorphology because they're both located within the floodplain of the Orontes River. I don't have time to go into all of that, but I can tell you that in our own uh, work we spent an enormous amount of time trying to get a sense just of the parameters of the site. And having now been working at Tainat for more than 10 years, I'm still, I'm actually less confident that I know the full extent of the site. Because essentially most of the site, which is sort of illustrated on this aerial photograph by the white shadow that you see is all buried under the active <coughs> alluviation of the floodplain of the Orontes River. And so we've had to do lots of uh, remote sensing, even coring all these little yellow dots that you see are more than 50 some cores that we've taken trying to get a better sense of the extent of the site. Probably somewhere between 40 to 50 hectares, but I really am not so sure I really know. Um, very quickly, what you're seeing on the right here is essentially uh, what we could map using a magnetometer in this box in area here, all in the lower settlement. We have not been able to start excavations yet for various reasons in this region, in this area, but you can tell that there's all kinds of material in, in our surveys of this area. We pulled up, I think, more than 40,000 pieces of pottery and artifacts. So it's a very rich lower city that remains to this point uninvestigated. Now in 2004, 2005, we began excavations and uh, our beginning was to try and go back to the Chicago excavations which had been conducted mostly in this dark area between 1935 and 1938 as a part of this Syrian Hittite expedition that I mentioned before. And we wanted to go in and excavate next to it to try and see if we could reconnect with those old excavation trenches and try and work on long-standing stratigraphic issues that had been um, debated by archaeologists working in this region for the past 60, 70 years after the Chicago team left in 1938. They never came back. World War, there was hostilities that broke out after the French mandate uh, was lifted. World War II followed shortly thereafter, and they never came back. Literally, we found, in some cases, the trenches still open from those excavations back in the 1930s. So we wanted to try and reconnect, and you can see the scar here, the dark shadow, is part of the excavation areas of the Chicago team. So this is now our field. What I want to focus on is field one, 
this area right here, and this is where I showed in the previous slide the area of the sort of scar of the excavations of the Chicago team. And it's in this area that we found uh, unexpectedly, and, and on our first day started coming in on top of early Iron Age deposits. But here's where I'm going to do a very quick uh, digression back to the early Bronze Age, because our early Iron Age levels have now reached early Bronze Age levels, and for those of you who are interested in that, in particular, the ongoing discussion now between uh, Tainat and specifically Ebla, which is not too far to the southeast, and uh, we have pretty confidently been able to connect our phases, and our excavations now are in what are known as the Amuk Phase J, which is corresponding to the um, Ebla sequence called Telmar D2B2, and we're just now starting to come down on top of Phase I, which is contemporary with the famous Royal Palace G horizon or the Telmar D2B1 at Ebla. And our excavations have come down on a massive building that you see in plan here, these yellow walls. I won't go into the detail, but here's a quick kind of isometric of them. These are part of a series of rooms. This is probably a storeroom with a doorway here. Unfortunately for us at this point, the main focus of the buildings is to the north in unexcavated areas. But our excavations have very quickly begun to come down on evidence of administrative material, including glyptic ceilings and cylinder seals and things like that, to suggest that perhaps we're looking at an administrative building, dare I say possibly even a palace. And why is that of interest in the context of the phasing sequence, this is for those of you who are really into pottery, and I'm not going to belabor any of this, but um, these are all the different styles that were first developed by the Chicago Expedition, and many have wondered, based on the what's called the Amuk phase sequence that brought, uh, the famous uh, Robert Braidwood con uh, constructed, we've been able to do with uh, full recovery, um, so far we've been able to find that the various types of ceramic traditions are coming up with similar percentiles to the ones that he had been able to estimate with very quick methods of excavation. And I mentioned that uh, one of the um, cultural markers in the north that shows strong ties to the south, in the early Bronze Age we talk about Kirbit Karakware, and we find enormous quantities of almost identical material which in our region has been called red-black burnished ware. Anyway, this is just um, a, a very quick digression. The historical connection though, that is most tempting and, or, or teasing or, or tantalizing is the ongoing work of the Italians working with Alfonso Archi on the epigraphy and also on the toponym specifically from the archive that was found in the Royal Palace G complex at Ebla they have now been able to um, propose a whole series of toponyms from that archive that we are able to link increasing, with increasing confidence to archaeological sites, extending from the interior, from Syria, into our um, uh, Amuk Plain here, and into the area around uh, Tainat. And in some very recent publications, Alfonso Archie has proposed that there are, there are a number of references to a place called Alalahu, which we think was not only a tie knot, but that was possibly then the predecessor to the second millennium or Middle Bronze Age, Alalak, that is associated with Tel Achana. And lastly, is that in some of the texts that they have been analyzing, they have little snippets of historical detail that help to date what are largely economic texts. And one of them has a reference to an event, a conflict that took place, and the tense of the, and the, the voice, is it an active voice or a passive voice, isn't clear on this particular text. It's not clear who defeated whom, whether it's Allah who defeated Ebla or Ebla defeated um, Allahu. But in any case, we're starting to pick up snippets of historical or political historical detail, and we're able to date some of this in a narrow time range in this late early Bronze Age or late third millennium context. So this is something that's quite excited. When I, exciting. When I was in, our, in a grad school, this period was treated as ex exclusively prehistory, but we're now beginning in this Levantine context to actually talk in fragmented but nevertheless increasingly more detailed historical terms. Now, I must continue and get back to the early Iron Age. And uh, so above those early Bronze Age remains, we came down on a sequence of um, rather modest structures that you see here that are mostly floors, small buildings, nothing really to get too excited about. 
but it was what was in association with this sequence of structures that has gotten so much attention, and that is the specifically, in particular, the pottery, which is referred to by most of the specialists as late Helladic 3C, or Mycenaean 3C, some go even into smaller um, with, uh, sort of gradations of the terminology. I won't uh, belabor that with you here. But we've now been able to build a pretty robust uh, collection of this material and to do a very finely graded or seriated sequence of this material in our early Bronze Iron Age sequence. And what we found is that while it is present, and it was present in large quantities, it was only one of multiple ceramic traditions, of which the dominant one has been referred to as local plain wares. And I'd like to throw this slide in because it drives home the plainness of the wares. Uh, another term that we're supposed to not use anymore, but I still kind of like to call it, um, it's called drab wear. And uh, the more polite term is Hittite monochrome wear. More importantly, this is the ceramic tradition of the Late Bronze Age. So if you were to excavate at nearby Alalak, this is what you would find. And so it's kind of interesting, if not remarkable and significant, that in the early Iron Age levels at Tainat, we're finding this ceramic tradition continuing to the point where technologically, stylistically, it's indistinguishable from the potting industry at nearby Late Bronze Age Alalak. Now what we've been able to do, and this is kind of boring, but just, I can hopefully show you it very quickly and make the point of why it's important, is that we've been able to seriate the material. The blue you see here represents that plain wear. The yellow represents the so-called late Helladic 3C tradition. And what you can see if you follow along the bottom here, this is our earliest, earliest Iron Age levels. So moving in time to the right, and you can see that at the beginning, in the earliest levels, Overwhelmingly, the pottery was of this local drabware, if you will, and very small amounts of this um, painted tradition. What we've been able to see or show in petrographic analysis now that we've begun uh, completing that's starting to produce results is that in the earliest levels, most of it is a non local variant of this so called late Helladic 3C but then it quickly becomes a local product. And as it grows in volume and percentage in terms of the whole ceramic assemblage of the site, it is exclusively a local product, okay? And basically, um, as you get down through into what we call our field phase 6B, it is not the largest percentage, but it's reaching to the point where it's 25 to 40 a percent or a maybe even uh, more. And then if you go all the way to the end of the sequence, uh, sorry, here at field phase three, you start to see the local pot, uh, plain wares begin to um, reassert themselves and eventually the painted ware tradition it de de declines in percentage and disappears. It simply ceases being, as far as we can tell, a part of the productive tradition of this, uh, this community. Now, we've also been able to distinguish multiple types of production, um, local production, uh, through the petrography, so that we've now come to call at least two groups. One is the red on pink ware, and the, the other is the black on white ware. The point here is that we're dealing with a remarkably complex and what I would, a big word, heterogeneous ceramic industry that represents a kind of breakdown of the more homogeneous traditions of the late Bronze Age. That drabware seems to reflect a more centralized ceramic industry. The early Iron Age, what, we, what strikes us as the characteristic of that period is the diversity of the potting um, industries at work producing what we're finding at the site. And that, and that just again to make the point that by the end of our early Iron Age sequence in our field one, um, we start to see a uh, decline in the, uh, the so-called late Helladic 3C uh, tradition. Now, there's a whole spectrum of other types of material culture in this early Iron Age that I don't have time to go into, including faunal data, botanical data, very, very interesting. I just have, just will mention very quickly two items. One is the proliferation of artifacts or of material tools that are related to textile production, including one that has been long assumed to be distinctive of these sea peoples, and that is these rather clumsy little uh, sun-dried loom weights. They're often referred to as spool weights because they look sort of like a spool. 
uh, for um, holding the thread. In any case, in our excavations, we found a plethora of material related to textile production that we think is a distinctive element, not only in terms of their craft industry, but also in terms of this non-local tradition, whomever these new um, settlers are. And part of that's because, and it's one of my favorite little finds here, it's about a centimeter, tiny little piece of, of, um, of um, plaster that has preserved very nicely the imprint of the tabby weave, which is a dead giveaway that they were using what we call the warp weighted loom. Um, a technology that was known and used in the, in, the, in the Near East going all the way back to the early Bronze Age, but wasn't part of the textile industry and the technology being used by the late Bronze Age population living at Alalak in the preceding uh, period. And here you see a representation or reconstruction of what that might have looked like. The other thing is, uh, other aspect of the material culture, and I say this intentionally because many have tried to characterize our excavations as a small little settlement that was something like a small agricultural village. But in fact, that's not the case, and one example of that is the wealth of metal finds that we have found. We've even found part of a metal workshop that has produced chemical and material, archaeometrical uh, evidence of both bronze and iron production in the workshop in the kind of experimental phase that uh, coincides with this early Iron Age context. And you see uh, gold jewelry, um, like here, silver. This is an affluent community that was clearly very well connected into the larger Eastern Mediterranean. And lastly, for just today, is that we've also found a range of epigraphic finds one of which has been quite surprising because in the context of this sort of Aegean connection, we have found a bulla, a stamp impression right here, and in the middle a number of hieroglyphic signs. It's a classic imperial, Hittite imperial stamp that would date most likely to the 13th, maybe even and to the 14th century. The fact that it's still being used as stamp apparently in the early Iron Age levels at Tainat speaks something again to the issue or to the question of continuity um, between the um, Bronze and Iron Age communities in the region. We've also found hints of possible what is known as Cyprophoenician in script. I don't have time to go into all of that, but what we seem to have is a very um, uh, affluent uh, and a very culturally diverse, maybe even linguistically diverse population living at the site. And lastly, when we try to map it out on our mound, this is the upper mound that I showed you earlier. It's about 20 hectares in size. And our excavations here have found early Iron Age deposits everywhere we have excavated, all these boxes. But if you add also the Chicago excavations, some of which were up in the north and in the south, everywhere we have gone on this 20 hectare upper mound, we have hit early Iron Age deposits and structures. And so it's pretty... Um, safe to argue, I think, that probably the entire mound was occupied during the early Iron Age, during this 12th century context, which would have made it about a 20 hectare site, and therefore, if not the largest, one of the very largest early Iron Age settlements in the east, entire eastern uh, Mediterranean world. So there's our excavation sequence, and I won't uh, really belabor it other than to say that we've begun filling in this gap, basically from around 1200 down to around 950 or 900 BCE, and we began to uh, fill in this uh, early Iron Age context. Before I move to the Neo-Hittites, I want to come back to Teta, and this is where we'll try and tie in some of the larger historical hypotheses that we're um, exploring and contemplating at this point. Just a little bit to the north of our Field 1 excavations, which are in the foreground here, we opened up excavations in this area and almost immediately came down on a massive building. You can see parts of the walls here. These are the tops of these walls. Some of them are three to four meters in width. And you can see that they go down many meters in depth. These are part of a massive building that we think the Chicago team had started to encounter. They called it their Building 14. And we've been trying to piece together from their field records what we think was a very large building that may have been as much as 100 meters north-south by 50 or more meters east-west. Our excavations have been digging up the southeastern corner of this massive complex. And this structure fits stratigraphically very nicely 
between the Chicago excavated buildings of the later Iron Age, which we would place up here, famous Bitalani palaces that I don't have time to show you, and our new, sorry, our new early Iron Age sequence, which is over here, and this building 14 complex fits nicely, stratigraphically right in between them. Now you may be trying to ask the question, why does that really matter? It comes back to the question that David Hawkins and some of the historians have been posing to us, which is where possibly might Keita, who we encountered on those inscriptions at Aleppo in the Storm God Temple, as well as in these other examples that I gave you, where might he fit into historically into that time frame? Because our early Iron Age sequence, by our radiocarbon dates and a variety of uh, other evidence, including the seriation of the pottery, we're placing as a 12th century into early 11th century context. The later Chicago excavations, we can confidently date to the 9th, 8th, and later centuries. And so we have this kind of gap in the middle between the late 11th and 10th centuries. And it's in that horizon that we believe this Teta, if he was a historical person, should be located. And it happens that this large complex that we started to encounter fits stratigraphically into that horizon. Anyway, we have a lot more work to do, but just to give you a picture of one of these hieroglyphic inscriptions, here you can see the fragment. There's several pieces, and it's up here, these signs that form part of the name of the place, Walasatin, or as it occurs at, at Aleppo, Palasatin, which at least at the moment uh, the historians are proposing or hypothesizing are toponyms for one and the same entity or ancient uh, land or kingdom. And one of the things we've tried to do is work with the old Chicago excavated field records, excavation field records, and see if we can't plot some of those artifacts based on our um, analysis of the material today. And so we've been doing that with about 100 fragments of these hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions that they found. Hawkins had already begun to group the fragments based on their orthography and paleography into what he hypothesized might be inscriptions, like, as he called them here, TT1 is tying out inscription 1, TT2 is tying out inscription 2, and so forth. And we've been trying to plot these on our new building, 14 complex, which you see in the blue here, and all these little triangular wedges are part of that tying out inscription 1 that makes reference to this um, Wallacetine or Palacetine uh, polity. So you can see that they place nicely in the vicinity of our new building. Now while I have this up here, I'm going to move very quickly to our own excavations of the Neo-Hittite complex associated with this uh, temple. And while, but while I have this slide, I want you to see all these little colored um, icons, the blues and the greens in particular, refer to a time of inscription too. And I'll come back to that shortly. So just to kind of uh, pull together what we think is our current understanding of the political history and how that may relate to the archaeological sequence. Uh, you can see now that we're beginning to piece together a kind of fragmentary king list. Um, David Hawkins most recently has proposed that there may actually be two tetas, and uh, there is the Aleppo inscriptions, and then there are the Meher de Shezar inscriptions that I mentioned, and he's placing those in the 11th and 10th century. Then there's the Arsuz inscriptions, the Tainat, and so forth. And they name different uh, rulers, and we're beginning to piece some of this uh, political history together based on these inscriptions. But obviously very fragmentary at this point, with a lot of questions. And at the same time, though, to try and generate hypotheses to guide our ongoing research, we've been trying to see where we might place them in our archaeological sequence. So as I just described or tried to explain, there is this kind of gap between the mid to late 11th century down into the early part of the 9th century. And it's in this gap that we think some of these uh, newly identified political figures should uh, fit. To conclude on this early Sea People's horizon then, what we think is going on is that in the aftermath of the collapse of the great imperial Hittite um, empire controlled, that controlled this green area that I mentioned earlier, we think that what happened in the early Iron Age was a, a fragmentation, certainly political fragmentation of that vast territorial uh, domain that they controlled, but you have the emergence of these smaller kingdoms. We've been struggling a little bit to come up with a terminology to describe them, 
kinglets or um, I've sort of hidden behind the vague term of a polity. We're not quite sure how at this early stage to define them in political terms, but what we're proposing is that there's kind of a mosaic of these small kingdoms that emerge in the aftermath of the collapse of the Hittite Empire. <coughs> and it's these kingdoms that then will coalesce into more sharply defined polities when they begin to encounter the Assyrians in the 10th and 9th, and particularly 9th and 8th centuries uh, as we move down into the first millennium. And we learn a little bit more about them historically based on the records preserved in the Assyrian uh, royal inscriptions. And we're proposing specifically the one that I mentioned at the beginning, the kingdom of Khati, centered at Carchemish, that's perhaps our best and most confident kingdom, but we're proposing that there probably was a kingdom in this area here, the North Orontes Valley, that was, uh, the royal city was based at Tonina, and that was referred to by some anyway as the kingdom or the land of Palestine, and that had cultural links with the Aegean world, with the Anatolian, Luvian, Hittite cultures, as well as local indigenous West Syrian uh, Semitic populations as reflected in things like the ceramic industry. So this is the um, sort of state of play by, let's say, the 10th century moving into the early 9th century. And uh, my last uh, horizon that I want to look at is a Neo-Hittite one. And so we're going to move from building what the Chicago team called as the building period one horizon with our big massive palace of building 14. And I'm going to briefly describe some of the material from their building period too, but focusing mainly on our own excavations. So I didn't have time to describe this earlier, but they found a series of large palaces called Bitilani, a very distinctive kind of Syro-Hittite palatial architecture. Um, the classic example is preserved in this building one structure here. The dominating feature were these portico entrances, porches with columns. The, the key, uh, the, defining characteristic of all of this monumental architecture was the facades. They really built spectacular facades, but once you get inside the building, it's kind of a mundane, little, rather modest structure. It's not a big grand palace, as you might expect. And the same applied to their temples, which we call Temple Inantis, uh, very simple little uh, rectilinear structures. And here <coughs> is the one that we've been excavating, uh, but already back in the 1930s, the Chicago team had found one that you see there identified as Building 2. So in our investigations of the Chicago excavations of these structures, we moved a little bit to the east to try and get away from their trenches. And that was our second great surprise, uh, unex very unexpectedly came down on this dramatically burned and destroyed uh, temple, which you see here marked as Building 16. And here you see a plan of it, um, the structure here. And I don't have time, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll come back to it and look at what we found in the burned, destroyed remains of the temple. Very, very interesting material. But for the few minutes I have left, I wanted to show you what we found in the trench to the south of it. So this is the entrance to the temple looking north in this direction. The old Building 2 temple is just off to the right here, and there's a paved, you can see part of the pavement here, there was a paved sort of central courtyard uh, between both of these structures. So after we had uncovered the temple in about 2011, 2012, we began excavating in this area between the two temples, and that's where our third great set of discoveries or surprises uh, came for us. And they came in the form of monumental sculptures, of which to my mind still the most stunning is this lion. For scale, just to give you a sense, we're about a meter and a half, a little bit over a meter and a half in height. This is an enormous lion carved out of basalt. It's in pristine uh, condition. It's beautifully carved. Um, there are a few elements, though, that suggest that the persons who carved it didn't know what a real lion looked like, or at least they hadn't gotten up in its face. Why? Because the teeth are carved like human teeth, not like those of a typical lion. So they hadn't gotten close enough anyway to see inside the mouth of a lion, even if they had seen the larger picture of it. Well, in the 1930s, the Chicago expedition in their building too had uncovered what was probably up until that point understood to be the most stunning piece of carved sculpture, and that is what we call the double lion column base that you see here. And there's the base and then a the, uh, local fellow for scale. And here is the face of our new lion, and they're basically, down to the whiskers, identical, not only in style, but even in um, carving technique and so forth, with only a few very minor 
detailed differences. One of them is the eyes. If you look at the eyes of the double line column base, they're actually in place. But in ours, there is a gap. And it's pretty clear, as you'll see in a moment why, that there were inlaid eyes and that this line was probably beautifully decorated when it was on display in a public context. Our excavations over the next couple of years began to uncover more monumental sculptures, including part of what we call a statue base. And these are pretty common in the north and have been found famously at places like Carchemish. Here you see one, and one of the more similar types to ours is at Zingerli, another Syro-Hittite or Neo-Hittite city up in the north. Um, basically what you have is you have two lions, or protomes we call them, with a male figure who is holding or trying to hold on to their mane um, in between them. It's a classic master and animal motif. It's a very ancient Near Eastern motif. It goes back even to the fourth millennium in Mesopotamia. Um, it signals, uh, this, it's a classic expression of civilization, basically um, imposing, the, um, imposing civilization, if you will, on the natural order by demonstrating it by having this male figure with the two subdued lions. So we have a part of one that we have here. You can see the lion, the hand, the head, and the arm and leg uh, before the break. But um, perhaps our most exciting discovery came the next year when we continued excavating in this area and we came down on part of a massive statue and then also part of a column base that you see here. The column base has a sphinx-like creature and then a winged bull-like creature on it. And then here you see the bust, or the, the upper torso of the human figure. And here you can see the inlaid eyes. I can tell you that these eyes are transfixing when people go to visit them now. It's on display in the museum in Antakya. They are drawn uh, to these eyes. Um, and this is a pretty typical, but not as well preserved, uh, statue. It has been, similar types of statues have been found at other Neo-Hittite sites in Turkey. Uh, but none uh, to this level of preservation, and also that have on the back a lengthy hieroglyphic inscription. And on here, it's a kind of autobiographical statement, and it tells us who we're looking at. We're looking at a guy by the name of Shupi Luliuma. That name should be familiar to you by now. It's clearly an allusion to the old Hittite royal names of Shupi Luliuma in this case. And uh, we actually now, from that fragmentary uh, political history that I've been describing, have at least two candidates, both a mid-10th century and a mid-9th century case. For, time, for reasons of time, I won't go into why we think it's the latter. We think that this is a statue of a king that we know fought against the Assyrians in the mid-9th century and who paid tribute, actually, at least according to the Assyrians, I'll say, um, during the reign of Shalmaneser III. Um, there's a specific reference to that in 858 BC. We think this is who this is a representative, a representation of. Now, we've just started to come down on this, so we haven't excavated all of it yet, so we're still arguing amongst ourselves in our excavation team what exactly we're dealing with. My view is that we are looking at a large gateway that would have led up into the citadel area and would have approached up into this sort of sacred precinct with the temples that I showed you earlier. In fact, we think that in part because these sculptures have been buried in holes. They've been, they dug out a hole and threw them in, and you would have had to literally walk on this pavement and walk over them to approach these uh, temples and, and public buildings uh, to the north or to the uh, upper part of the picture. And so we think that that's part of, it's a kind of act of desecration that, that was conducted with these um, sculptures and, and monuments and that they once stood as a part of a large public gate system. Now, we have a lot of work to do before we can um, argue that in a more definitive case, but pieces that were found, even in, for example, this one back in the late 1800s, <laughs> suggests that we have actually part of a large public processional way that would have led up to this gateway and that would have then led into the inner um, citadel zone where the temples and palaces that I described earlier were located. And we have parallels for this. We have really good parallels. The best one is at Carchemish. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of that. And we've also got other pieces. Another large human figure was found by the Chicago team near one of the lower gates to the city, Gateway 7. So we think we've got probably part of a massive public 
processional way that would have led from Gateway 7 up through this way into our new gateway here, and then ultimately up into the area where the palaces and buildings that I was describing earlier are located. So this is essentially kind of what we think. Um, there's even an outer gate in the lower city, and um, for, for re various reasons we think that they had um, very um, spectacular kind of spectacles, uh, processions and events that would have taken place that would have led, involved uh, processions moving through these gate systems progressively up, or up into the inner city. And this is part of the Neo-Hittite kingdom of Patina. So another reason why we are comfortable with the Palestine reference of the early Iron Age is that we think we've got in a kind of slightly later emendation of that term preserved the earlier name in the form of the kingdom of Patina. Um, that is recorded in quite a few historical texts, including in particular royal inscriptions from the Assyrians. So that is where things were by around 738 BC. And um, if you, I can just have a couple minutes, I will, and if you can indulge, I will try very quickly to end by a, a sort of a second digression here into the Neo-Syrian period. And uh, it's, it was a stunning discovery for us in part because um, we did know about the second western campaign of Tiglath-Pileser III, who's the great empire builder of the Assyrians, and he describes in detail how he campaigned in 738, and he conquered this place called Unki, and destroyed its royal city called Kunulua, and it's a kind of uh, diplomatic phrase to me, um, the king, his name uh, it was Tutamu, forfeits his life, and the region was annexed into Assyria and became a province of the expanding Assyrian imperial realm. What I don't have up on here is that the pretext for Tiglath-Pileser's attack is that this poor Neo-Hittite king by the name of Tutamu, apparently, at least according to Tiglath-Pileser's account, broke his loyalty oath to the king. And that's a very common political statement in the ancient Near Eastern world, and it has taken on a new meaning, a more vivid one for us, based on the discoveries in our temple. So just a couple of quick slides here, and then I'll end. Um, in that temple that I, I described, we found a very intense burning, so intense that even some of the superstructure mud brick of this wall, of the walls of this building, had fused into and vitrified with the base of the structure. And it preserved a whole series of artifacts in situ, in a kind of classic Pompeii effect like manner, which means that we can actually begin to investigate the primary context of the finds within this area and perhaps even begin to reconstruct some of the ritual activities that took place in this temple. And that's what's been quite uh, so stunning. Uh, most of the artifacts include things like, on the, uh, I should mention very quickly, that in the back here, the inner chamber, the Holy of Holies, if you will, is a little elevated podium with an altar and then a whole series of artifacts. Those artifacts, I've assembled them here. Most of them are things like lamps. There's a jug. If you look carefully here, you can see the jugs, the, the spout has, has uh, melted uh, from the heat of the fire. And the, here is a glazed ware um, basin of a classic Assyrian style of pottery. And then a number of other things that we did, initially didn't know what to make of, including these little sort of thumbtack-like uh, nails, and then a series of hooks that look an awful lot like the hooks you would have for hanging curtains in a window or, 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 or a tapestry on a wall. <coughs> so here's what this material looks like. It's classic 7th century. It's Assyrian. Here's a um, close-up of that uh, basin. Um, it was been burned so intensely that you, can, you could hardly see any of it left. But this gives you a bit of a sense from another piece. It was a beautiful um, glazeware vessel uh, from the 7th century context. But in the mix of all this Assyrian material, we also found a few artifacts that were local, indigenous, and Syro Anatolian style, including what we call a Pyxis, that has here the ancestral feasting scene, the, the, the patriarch, the father figure, his uh, female partner or wife, and then his son with a palm frond, uh, sort of um, venerating him, and then they're eating. And yeah, this is a kind of bread and probably some meat, and then he's got a little cup in his mouth. This is a classic Syro Anatolian uh, ancestral feasting scene carved on this little pyxis that was found up on the um, temple. But lastly, we found also a corpus of tablets, cuneiform tablets that you see here in part. Most of them are omen texts, so they predict 
when you're supposed to do something, like maybe when you're supposed to get married, or when you're supposed to build the annex onto the house, or maybe start the planting season, the harvest, and so forth. And there are other interesting documents, although they're pretty um, plain in the sense that they're not, each one is, they're, they're very stylistic, but they basically have all the activities on a vert, they're like a spreadsheet with the vertical column of activities, and then across the top are the months of the year, and then basically as you work your way down the column here, it tells you when that, when you're supposed to, when the optimal time is to engage in those kinds of activities. So when we found these documents, it was immediately interpreted that this must be part of an archive, maybe even a temple archive, something like that. But what changed all of that was our last, last find, and that is this enormous tablet. For the sake of scale, that is about 30 centimeters, and that's about 45. So it's like about the size of uh, what we call a tabloid newspaper, and it's about almost 700 lines. It's a very dense and lengthy inscription. And um, when we go to the end of it down here, this is the back side, there are two sides of it, it has the date when this thing was written, if you will, or sealed. We have a little chip that we weren't able to save, and so we're not certain about whether it's the 16th or the 18th day, but we can tell you that it was sealed and signed in the 12th, second month of the year 672. We can be that precise of the date of this document. What is this document? It's essentially, it's been called a vassal treaty. It's essentially a document in which officials throughout the Assyrian imperial realm were charged with loyalty oaths to the king. And specifically in 672, we know that they were gathered from all over the Assyrian imperial realm to Assyria to plead, pledge their loyalty and to bind it in this loyalty oath to Esarhaddon. And what he was most concerned about was his successor, that he wanted to make sure that when he died, they would continue to remain loyal to his chosen successor. And there was some internal uh, political intrigue that was happening at the time. And he wanted them to remain loyal to um, his chosen, uh, who was, was Ashurbanipal. So this is a very important historical document. What was stunning was a few of them had been found at places like Nimrud back in the 1950s, but none of them had been found in a temple in a context like we found it at Taina. And this has changed. Um, everyone's thinking because clearly these were essentially display objects and this takes us back to the contents in that inner chamber. Many of those omen texts that I just described have perforations in them and other markings that indicated that they were for, suspended and were on display in that inner sanctum. And, um, and we have evidence and indication that maybe the large oath tablet itself was possibly also um, hanging or suspended and on display in that inner chamber. This is exactly where we found it here, next to the altar on this uh, podium. So the last part of this is that um, looking through Assyrian texts, we've begun to be able to reconstruct what those ritual activities might have been and why and how they were um, conducting themselves. The artifact inventory from our excavations matches a set of things you were supposed to do when you wanted to take a sacred document and transform it into a religious or sacred text in the Assyrian context. And we have a kind of how-to manual um, called the Covenant of Ashur that describes the ceremonies that you're supposed to go through, where you then take this document and it is transformed into scripture, if you will, into sacred documents. And it seems almost certain that that is what is, was, being, um, was part of the ritual activity that was taking place in this temple. The renewal, essentially, of, on an annual basis of your covenanted loyalty oath to the in this case, a Syrian king, and more perhaps importantly to his god, Ashur, who was seen to be the supreme god of the universe. I'm using language that hopefully will be evocative to you of other ancient Near Eastern cultural contexts, because this is probably the same kind of setting for many of those other um, contemporary um, cultural experiences, dealing with the role of covenant renewal and so forth. And we also can even go further than uh, the tablets. We can talk about the temples. They actually parallel very closely with temples that were found and excavated in the um, royal cities of the Assyrians, for example, at Nimrud. I don't want to take any more time to go into detail with them, <laughs> except for just to use this one example where um, our double temple complex perpendicular onto a central courtyard, right down to the, the pavement and every last little architectural detail is the same. <laughs> 
as we found in our complex. So it's, it's, it's almost impossible, really, I think, to argue anything uh, differently. We even have a possible indication that there might have been a little ziggurat or some kind of elevated shrine out in back of our temples, uh, something that the Syriologists and the Mesopotamian scholars have had a hard time <laughs> accepting at this point. So um, this is also still underway, and we're trying to piece this together. But I'll conclude by just giving you an image of the citadel at Korsabad, which was a contemporary of our Tainat complex, as built by either Tiglath-Pileser or probably actually by Sargon himself. We've recently found a few fragments of an estela that we are almost certain was erected at the site by Sargon himself, probably commemorating some of the buildings that we've now found. And here you see actually a reconstruction of the citadel of his royal city as he built it at Korsabad, ancient Dur Shurukin, in the same late 8th century context. So it, it's a kind of conversion of a lot of very interesting um, bits of historical and archaeological evidence that has enabled us to reconstruct with a level of detail that you rarely ever get in archaeology um, and was entirely unexpected. This is the Neo-Syrians. Somebody destroyed that place. That's the last, last story. And we remain um, in search of the culprits. Uh, we have some suspects, but I'll leave that for a lecture on another day. So thank you very much for your patience. Um,